Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Why don't we start off and I just wanted to say um, thank you for being part of the Northeast uh, BC Métis Storytelling Project. This project is meant to uh, share the knowledge of elders and any um, really First Nations uh, individuals that have any knowledge to pass on to future generations or current gener generations as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us here. Now, you want to start off with a prayer, is that correct? Okay, well, why don't we start, start off with a prayer, go ahead. Okay, God our Father, our Creator, give us courage, let us be of one mind, make us righteous, thankful, and proud. Help us to work together as teachers in preparing our youth for the future. Create, creator, provide us with direction and inspiration as we build the road for our future leaders to follow. We need strong leaders in order to have strong communities. In prayer, let's remember our community members that have passed and to also remember the ones that are struggling with different types of fatal diseases. Let's send prayer for strength to each and everyone that is ill right now. Hi, hi. Thank you. And this has been passed down to, to me from one of my elders that I did my studies with. Women are the true leaders and teachers. They teach us compassion, unconditional love, respect, honor, integrity, and intuition. To heal a man, you heal one man. To heal a woman, you heal a nation. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Well, for anyone that will begin watching this, why don't we, before we go on a little bit further, uh, start with your first and last name. Go ahead. I'm Sadie Lucan. Okay, now Sadie, were you named after someone? No. No? Okay. And what about uh, your last name, Lucan? Do you know much about the heritage or anything, uh, any history behind the last name? And they're, they're from Germany. Okay. Now, that would be your married name, if I'm not mistaken. What about uh, your uh, like First Nations uh, last name? What would that be? Supernaut. Supernaut, okay. Mm -hmm. And do you know any history behind that last name? Well, that's my family, mm -hmm. uh, Métis family. Do you know, uh, what it, does it mean anything specific or uh, any specific history that uh, you were told maybe? Well, I do have the history of our name, which are warriors. And um, it has a special meaning, but right now I can't think of it because I don't know, I can't remember as well as I used to. Uh, so uh, I know it means warrior people, strong people, strong-willed, honest, integrity, everything, and everything my father has told me is true. And I, I uh, researched it later in years, mm -hmm. but he has taught me all that. Oh, that's awesome. Now you have something in front of you there. It's uh, my introduction. Okay, go ahead, please. Since I said my name already, 
I am your community knowledge keeper, storyteller, language instructor, dance theater in director, and I have trained for a lot of different workshops which have enhanced my daily life experiences. I am also a certified alcohol and drug counselor. I grew up in Northern Alberta on a Métis settlement, living a Métis traditional lifestyle. As a family unit, we worked very hard growing up. We had an acreage with our own horses, cows, pigs, chickens, and miles and miles of garden. Having no electricity, we stored our meat and vegetables in a root cellar. So everyone, no matter how young, if you can help in any way, it was great, greatly appreciated. Was there a specific, do you mind if I ask you some of these questions as you tell me some sure. of that? Was there a specific job that you did growing up or are you gonna to touch on it uh, there? Growing up, we did all the chores inside and outside. My dad was away working. My mom was home and uh, she only focused on feeding us. Her job was in the kitchen. We did all the chores inside and outside before and after school. So dishes, cleaning up, making beds. My job was dishes. I always thought I was the Cinderella of the family. So I remember Cinderella sweeping around the stove and heating up her water to do the dishes. That was me. <laughs> and did you enjoy it or did you find it too much work? What did you think of it? It was that? just part of life. You didn't dare grumble. It's just survival, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. I'll let you continue. What's on your next page? But after our work, Every day, my dad would be home, then the fun would begin. My papa would always pick up the fiddle after dinner and my mama would dance with us. Sometimes people, people walking by would hear the music and walk in and join us. The more, the merrier. And before you know it, the house would be full of people and then the walls would come down. And the next day we would have a complete different looking house. How cool is that? There is always lots of fun and laughter, good memories, no alcohol. But like everyone else, we had tough times. We never woke up to a cozy, warm house. Although my papa would get up and make fires before he woke us in the morning, it was still pretty chilly. He would have water on for washing up and also a huge pot of porridge and a big pail of fresh milk on the top. And if my papa was away, only then my, my mama never cooked breakfast, but if my papa was away, he, she did. But the rest of the day was spent in the kitchen for her and we had to do all the chores and kind of repeating myself before and after school. No video games, no TV, just hard work. Sometimes when I think back, I think we had our own little residential school happening. I could not speel, speak my language during school hours for punishment, I was strapped. It was tough because I did not know a word of English when I started school. When I went home and told my parents, some days were not too great. I would be strapped again because they believed the teachers would not strap me for no reason. Later in years, I also wondered why my parents, like all other parents in our community, were so afraid of the authority people. And after, and later learned the threat of losing their children was always there. Must have been difficult, eh? Did your parents ever talk to you guys about that? Losing children? Uh, yes. But they never explained why they were so afraid of, of the authority. Um, there wasn't too much that was explained to us. Um, everything was always a secret. And that's what I disliked about my childhood. So I made it different from my children. Uh, I love my language. 
uh, and hoped to pass it on, but I didn't pass it on to my children. You know why? Because I didn't want them to suffer the way I did because I was cursed with that language. That's what I learned at school. So in going back to feeling like we had our own little residential school happening, I think we did. My mom was in residential school, but it was never reported. We never talk about it. Therefore, her parenting wasn't the loving kind. But um, there were just parts of our life that was missing. But we didn't miss it because we didn't have anything to compare it to. Everybody grew up the same. We're all in the same settlement. We're all Métis. And we didn't know we had a title till later on in years. We were just all Indian. Now, why do you think, or did you ever find out, why do you think everything was kept in such secrecy? Fear. Fear. Did you ever get to talk to your parents about that? Uh, later, when I was older, when I started my own journey, because I had to put all the pieces together. But when I was young, I didn't dare ask questions. It wasn't my place. My place was to listen to what I was told, do that, and don't ask questions. That's how we grew up. And I, I'm sorry if I missed it before, but you said how many of you were there in the family, in your family? How many brothers and sisters? There was 11 of us totally, total in fa uh, biological, but two were adopted. So there's 13 of us. And where do you fit in the third? In the very middle. Very middle. Wow. Did you enjoy that? And I lived up to it. Yes. <laughs> you did a lot of work. I had to be allowed to be heard. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Wow. That's a lot of uh, a lot of people around. Now, where was it uh, that you guys uh, grew up? In Paddle Prairie, Alberta. Paddle Prairie, Alberta. Okay. And how long were you there for? We were there, we grew up there, but moved to BC and we've been here since. We all moved to Puskupi. My whole family lived there. So was everyone born in Paddle Prairie? No. Okay. Uh, I wasn't. I was born in North Vermilion. They lived in Hay Lakes. And I don't know what that is, if it was a uh, settlement also. Um, but I was born on the move to Paddle Prairie. I was born in a tent in February. Did your mom tell you the story about it? Yeah, they always had midwives travel with them if they're pregnant. Because Métis people traveled a lot, right? But Paddle Prairie is where my father found that we should live. So that's where we moved. Well, it wasn't me. I was still in. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a say back then. Uh, I didn't have a say. <laughs> and what did your dad do for work? My dad trapped like everyone else. And, and he also hunted, supplied all the meat and that. And we had our vegetables all winter. Um, and he worked in the sawmill and he built uh, cottages with a cottage roof. Uh, wow. Did he build, did he get to build something nice for you guys eventually when you settled somewhere? Oh yeah. Do you remember any of that? No, I was too little. Too little. That's okay. Continue, please. I am so happy I kept my language so now I can teach to whoever wants to learn. Now let's talk about a little bit about <clears throat> maybe um, let's start with your bit more of your background, if that's okay. Um, are you Métis or non-status for anyone that's watching? That Métis. Métis, okay. And uh, which cultural group are you from? Like Cree? Cree. Cree, okay. And do um, you recall any, um, I guess, any interesting stories growing up once you guys were in Paddle Prairie that stuck out from your childhood? 
Oh, there's just too many. <laughs> I guess the Christmases to, to stand out. Why is that? Because uh, when we got up, we, we rushed to open, or we usually just had a stocking. We didn't have presents, but we always had a stocking. And there was always a, an orange in the toe and peanuts and candy and the rest of it. If it was a good year, we may get a present, but usually we didn't even expect it because we never got it, right? So it was no big deal. But, and then we ate breakfast and then we all got in the sleigh and uh, horses and uh, we would all get ready. And it took us quite a while because there was quite a few of us. So my dad would help, but he'd already hitched the horses, right? He didn't have to warm them up, right? But he hitched the horses and he'd come in and help mom and we'd get all bundled up in quilts and everything. It was cold winters back then, not like now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so off we'd go. And one, one Christmas, my dad was a little agitated. We were just taking too long. So he said, come on, come on. So we all rushed out and got into our benches and bundled up and and then he says, hey, it takes so long, but you don't dare to talk back. So he goes to, come here, yells at the horse and they take off and he takes off with them. In his anger, he forgot to hitch it to the sleigh. So <laughs> <laughs> we all dove under our quilts and laughed under there. <laughs> so the horses just take off and you guys stayed right there? We oh. stayed, he left. Oh, just came okay. <laughs> They pulled him right out. Oh, I'll never forget that. I do I do <laughs> have a book that I'm writing on the supernatural humor. Yep. No sadness. It's just humor. Awesome. All these stories and oh but that one always stands out at Christmas. I remember him <laughs> And he had such a good sense of humor. Right? So he he wasn't angry. He got up and he brushed himself, looked at us and just burst out laughing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then we could laugh really uh, oh that's really nice it looks like he had a good sense of humor then mm -hmm. that's nice. but grandparents first so we went and fed them breakfast oh, that's nice. yeah and so. they're they'd be waiting for us yeah speaking of grandparents do you know uh, where your grandparents came from from like your dad's side and your mom's side uh i have all that history um, my grandmother was from, um, Alberta beach area, Lake St. Uh, my grandfather was from, uh, I think he traveled from Montreal and some of his family ran across the border to the States and the rest moved West. Wow. So, um, and he was, um, he, he taught us a lot about natives and he all read us the Bible every night. I used to be, I didn't want to sit there and listen to stories. Boy, I wish I had that now, you know, the children, they don't fully understand. Um, and he told us about the people that were going to come over and take over one day. He said, he was reading out of this Bible with all those little, you know, he would just read every day, different story or whatever, and, and about God. And um, he said, these people that are gonna come across this, of course he said it all in Cree, come across a big waters, right, big ocean, I said, there were rags on their head, but their main, he said, and they're going to come over and they're going to take over our land. Rags on their head, he said, and we're rolling on the floor laughing. He said, how would you like it if they laughed at you? Because you wear feathers in your hair. See, you don't, you don't notice, you know, the different cultures and, and that's where racism starts. But my grandpa would explain to us about different, showed us the drum because our music was the fiddle. 
but he taught us the drum. And every night he'd sing to us and pray with us. What a treasure we had. So did you learn how to play the drums too? I play the drum. I made a, a I, I was with Teresa when we made the CD. <clears throat> oh, Teresa Glidu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about your grandma? My grandma was just a hustle bustle four by four. <laughs> and why do you say that? Because she never stopped. And that woman was never sick. She just go and she'd wear, you know, covered up to the neck and up to the wrist and scourged right down to the floor. And she'd just swish when she walked and she walked so fast and short four by four. I mean, she was as tall as she was wide. Sorry, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> but, and my father, grandfather was almost seven feet tall. But if she ordered a bark, she barked an order, he ran. <laughs> so I think that's where we get our strength from. Yeah, from the female side, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a good thing. And now, did you, while you were in Paddle Perry or when you guys moved here, did you attend school? Oh, yes. Yeah. From? I attended school in Paddle Prairie and I quit there. I was forced to quit because my mom got very sick and our girls are far and far between. The oldest in the family are three girls. Then there's two boys and then me. And then there's two boys. Actually, there's three boys and then the girl. So they were, I was the only female left when the three left home. Mm -hmm. So she said, you have to quit school. And I cried and cried and cried because I just loved studying. I've always loved to learn. So uh, I said, well, when could I go back? What grade was that when you had to stop going? That was grade nine. And she said, when I get better, you could go back. But it never happened. And uh, I got pregnant very early in age. Um, But uh, I didn't go back to school until much later when my first marriage broke. Uh, I was never allowed to. Uh, I didn't know the difference then that you had your own voice. I never had my own voice. Um, so I, w I went to work as a coal miner. You did? Yes for 17 years. And that's where I met my second husband. And I got injured at the mine. And I just, depression set in, diabetes set in, because I just, I wanted to go back to work. I never loved anything as much as I loved my job, I don't think, except my children. But, you know, I just, the freedom, your own paycheck, I immediately bought my own house with my, my dad's help all the way and uh, broke from payday to payday, but I had to buy a house because I walked away with nothing. So I had to build myself up from the ground and I bought a house and a little car and he was so proud of me and encouraged me all the way. I couldn't have done it without him. and. Um, so when I was injured and I was not allowed, wasn't able to ever do that job again. So WCB retrained me to where I went back and I upgraded. I went to the local college, upgraded, graduated, and then uh, 
WCB phoned and said, well, you know, we're now have to pick a career. You have to pick a career because your WCB is going to, you know, no longer. I was well enough, but not well enough to work at that job. So I have to find a new. So they said, what job would you like? What career? And I said, well, my chosen career is native fashion. That's an interest. I said, I don't know how to sew, but why can't I learn? But I could design, I know I can. So, because I've always scribbled and, 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 and so I said, oh, no, no, that's too good for you. Said, you're Indian, so what we're going to do is we're going to send you to uh, Aboriginal alcohol and drug training. But I said, that's not fair. All I know about alcohol is what I've seen. That's not a feeling. How could I honestly help my clients when I've never experienced it? Yes, I had drinks, but I'm not alcoholic. I never hit bottom. You know, I enjoyed a few drinks here and then, and it wasn't always. And I said, I I'm sorry, I can't do that. Well, you're going to be cut off. I have no funds, no job, no nothing. So I thought about it and waited them out because I was supposed to make up my mind yesterday and held on, held on. Finally, I opened that package. Lo and behold, it's everything I've always wanted. I thought, it's going to open so many doors for me. I don't have to do alcohol and drug, but with this training, Plus my knowledge, I could do my own thing. So what was in the package? What well, all the information, all the pamphlets of what I'd be learning, the whole year's training was in there. It was like... But it was for like fashion though? No, not fashion. They denied that right out, straight oh, out. I thought they this was the package for alcohol and drug. Oh. No, there was no give to that. I thought they gave in a little bit to that or something. No, no. So, but when you saw that package, you thought, okay. This is I threw it in the first corner and left it there. But my stubbornness wasn't going to help me this time. The threat was there, but I denied them until the last possible minute. And then I opened it. And I thought, God, you always have different plans. Thank you. So what did you do after? That? I called them. Mm -hmm. They made arrangements, packed up my bag the first time I was away from home alone. Drove to St. Albert, and I drove back and forth. In any road condition, I was driving back and forth and trained for my ALCA, and I graduated. And I come to work at the healing center, just 20 kilometers out of Dawson. And uh, so what I did was, I had a very good ED. And we sat and talked. It wasn't really an interview. It was more like a visit and what I had to offer. And so I told him, I want to go the spiritual route on this. If I could do open up the program with my spiritual knowledge. And because an alcoholic I know loses the higher power immediately because of their shame and their denial. And this is what you have to give back to them. That's the gift you give to the clients. So, um, so I explained my situation and told him this is what I'd like to do. And uh, he thought it was a great idea and he let me write the program and I opened every morning. And the other counselors attached themselves to the program and it was very successful. And once in a while he would get into trouble and I'd have to do one-on-one, -on -one, but that is okay. And uh, so 
I was a counselor, but I wasn't, wasn't my main focus was to do the counseling part. I did more of the spiritual smudging and praying. And Did you find that, now obviously there was meaningful work being done there. Very meaningful work. But did you, yourself, did you feel like you had accomplished something there? Yes, but very soon I found I got to move on to bigger and better. What was that? Bigger and better, I come to work for, actually it was my brother, Don, that talked me into coming to work for the Aboriginal Society here in Dawson Creek. But that didn't last long either. So after that, I said, okay, I'm done with bosses. I want to do my own thing. I don't need a boss because they don't know what I'm about anyway. So I come and I volunteered at the Métis office but soon was always left in charge. Nobody around. I had to make all, make all the decisions. So they were gonna have an AGM and some of the people said, well, you should come, you should run for president. And I said, oh no, that's above me. I, I could never do that. And walked away, never went to the AGM. Continued volunteering and be alone. And so eventually, I started seeing that Nima was in trouble. So the next time come around and I let my name stand and got voted in as president. And uh, found I was doing no different. I was <laughs> Still making the same decisions? The only thing is, there was no money, <laughs> and the bills were <laughs> stacking up. And I was sitting at my desk praying one day, there's got to be something, something, we got to do something. And I think it was about the next day the phone rang, and oil and gas company phoned me and said, is this the Métis office? And I said, yes, it is. And uh, he said, do you have any people that we can put to work? I thought, how do I answer that, you know? Uh, and I said, not at this moment, but I don't see why we wouldn't because there's a lot of people I know that are out of a job. Mm -hmm. And so he said, okay, we can put them to work immediately. I said, well, how many do you need immediately? He said, even one would do. I said, oh, I can get you one because my son was out of work right then. So I said, I'll get you him and then I'll get, I'll, you know, phone people and make a list of people and their skills and whatever. I'll get you that, I promise. So they said, perfect, that's what we want to hear. So I started working for oil and gas, got the NEMA. Uh, NEMA never went down. And for 15 years, I run the organization. And just recently I resigned and I said, I need to do what I've always wanted to do. And so they had a meeting and I gave, I gave my resignation actually at a big AGM. We, we brought Dale Bumstead, the mayor, mm -hmm. and I brought the AGM to Dawson Creek. It's always been in Vancouver for 20 years and Walter. The three of us, Walter, did the speech in Vancouver. And we didn't think we'd get it, but you never know unless you try, right? And we brought it and we made a big splash. Uh, I mean, we had it at the Encana Center. I was there. You were you? Were you at our AGM? Yeah. Well, that's where I resigned. But since then, I've been here. That's a few years. And then uh, Brenda got in as president. Perfect, you know. And uh, so since then we've been here. And now I've got my workstation setting. I'm setting it up. We're just getting everything together to get going. And I'm filling all my binders with wisdom and so they can be passed on.
They all have the Métis sash on them. Do you see my binders? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. And Wayne and I are going to do that. Wow. And one of the programs is the TP teaching. And I have two teepees at home. Yeah. For children. Yeah. That's nice. So do you, the program is aimed at teaching children how to make one? Is that the idea? Uh, it's TP stories. Oh, TP stories. Okay. Of course, they'll learn about the poles and everything. Mm -hmm. It's not going to have the poles because they're children's teepees, right? Yeah. But yeah, I have all that in one binder. Wow. Yeah. And I also have, um, there I go. The rites of passage is very, very, there's a lot of learning in that. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, it goes from birth all the way to uh, your final your final passage. Wow. Yeah, so uh, I want to do that program. We'll have dancing, drumming. Uh, hopefully, I, I, that's my fiddle in there, the pink one, but I just never had the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of fiddle and, you know, music and different things, <clears throat> did your family ever teach you any, like, traditions, like any, like, um, music? Uh, or any, I guess, like uh, tap dancing or anything like that while you were growing up? Oh, we did all the dances right in our home. <laughs> Mom taught us and my dad played the music. Our floor, because he goes like this, yeah. would be just bare. <laughs> we didn't care. <laughs> the walls would come down. That's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to tear that wall down and make this into a dance hall. <laughs> Music has always been a big part of my growing up. Dancing. Community dances, we all go. There's no such thing as a babysitter. You can walk, you can dance. Mm -hmm. So would you say that's something that you then like took like a very traditional part of your family growing up and then have you passed it on to your children and other young generations? It just takes you away. Uh, maybe we'd have been depressed if we didn't have it for all the hard times we had. I don't know. But like I said, we had nothing to compare to. Everybody lived the same life, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. That's nice that you still got to enjoy yourselves like that though. Yeah. Must have been fun. It was fun. And toys, we didn't have any. So we we made our own. What, what, what would you guys make? We made carts, trucks. We cut logs, make uh, the tires, yep. poles, and my dad would use some of the homemade soap and put it in there. So, you know. <laughs> and we'd have horse races. We'd have a willow with, uh, uh, you know, the willow. And then we'd go picking, because there was drinking on the settlement. And they had the long bottle, beer bottles. Okay. And uh, we'd pick them and wash them up. And, and then my brother would kind of, I don't know how he did it, but he'd kind of cut them. And, and then when you put it in the ground and made the horse's hoof, mm -hmm. and then he'd stick it on each a willow. He was our leader. My brother Lester, he, uh, we lost him a few years back. So we'd hold those two and, uh, and then we'd have one tied up to these and then one going between our legs and leave the bushy branches for the tail so it made a trail. I don't know why a horse is never but anyhow that was our one of our toys and we had a race truck <laughs> and horses. We wow. rode horses all the time. You guys got creative. Oh yeah. He was very creative yeah. and one day mom, we knew mom we were losing our mom and he said I'm gonna pick up the fiddle and I'm gonna play her a tune before she dies because she was uh, he was uh, the favorite my mom's favorite and she let us know we were all at the dinner table and she told us we didn't care because he was our favorite too <laughs> <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> 
the theater movies were 25 cents. We couldn't afford to go, all of us. So he'd go. And he'd come home and react to the whole thing. And it's like we could see it. <laughs> so we got to see the movies too. Your imagination. <laughs> That's hilarious. Wow. That's definitely a... Uh... I've never heard that one, you know, having one family member go and then retell oh, yeah. it to the family. And we didn't mind he went. They always got the quarter for him, but they couldn't do it for all of us. And that's fine, because if he went, we'd hear about it. If I went, I wouldn't be able to tell it. And the others, right? So he was very good at that. Yeah, very that's good. He should have been an actor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. And he made her a fiddle tune called the Capo Real. Capo is her maiden name, or dad's name. Her mother's name was Thomas. That's pretty, pretty cool. Nice stories. Now, speaking of family, can we talk a little bit about your family? Like the family that you created? Oh, the one I created? Yes. Um, you said you were uh, married. You had your first marriage, right? Mm hmm Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I had all my children my first marriage. Uh, well, I had the oldest before I was married. So him and I kind of grew up together. And we became very, very good friends throughout the years, even to the last. I'd go to him if I had a problem. We'd solve it together, and he'd do the same. He'd call, and we'd be on the phone two, three hours. Um, so I miss him very much. Um, I'm just can't do that with my other children. There's just that certain connection, right? Um, and we lived a rough life in the first marriage. And why do you say that? If I may ask. Well, he wasn't treated very nice and neither was I. But together we were strong and we survived. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. And uh, my other children, he was a good provider, a very good father, a good provider, but a rotten husband. And it's too bad because as young as I was, I was married for life. I did not want a divorce, but it was my children themselves that told me to leave him. They seen too much. Mom, get out of here, they'll kill you. I went to my father and I asked him for advice. I don't know what to do. My children are telling me to leave. He said, well, if you're telling me to break up a marriage, I can't do that. And said, I know you're hiding. I know you're hiding him. And I know you're not telling us anything. But he said, a father knows. So all I can say is, if it's bad, it'll never get better. It'll get worse. And if he's beating you, he'll end up killing you. I'm sorry, but I have to say that. He said, I've seen too much of it. So it's up to you. Are you going to stay and hope he changes? Because that's why you're there. You hope he'll change because of your children. So it was a very rough decision, you know, back and forth. And I finally got up the nerve to leave. And it was my son and his son that told me to leave. My second son and my oldest son sat me down. Mom, we have to talk to you. They said, we want you to leave. And he said, we know why you're here. Because we're your babies. And we'll be your babies until we're 80. But, he said, leave, please leave. We know you won't leave us, but please leave him. We see what he does. So, I thought about it again. I didn't leave immediately. Uh, 
and it broke my heart to leave. I took one step at a time for sure. I wanted to run, it would be so easy to run back. I had no education, no experience for job, but I did save money, grocery money. <laughs> so I must have been planning. <laughs> so I survived on that. That's when I got to work with the mine. And he told me, he said, and he threw that in my face. He said, you will never get a job. You will never, you know, you have no education. He wouldn't allow me to go back to school. Uh, so and he said, you have no work experience. And I said, but look at me, I'm healthy. He said, you're going to end up on welfare. I said, why would I go on welfare? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm healthy. I said, if I have to scrub toilets, so be it. I will feed myself. And he, I said, you've always threatened you'd take the children away from me if I walked out. Well, I give them to you for now because I have nothing to offer them but my love and we can't eat off that. You got a big house, you got a beautiful house, you got everything, you got money in the bank. Like we saved a lot. Mm -hmm. So I said, you got it all, take it, but I'm leaving. I'm not going to ask you for anything. I'm not going to fight for anything. And where were you at that point? Where, uh, what place, like what city or town? Dawson Creek. That was still in Dawson. And so you stayed in town and started working at the mine? Yeah, I went to the mine and I lived there in an apartment. And I come in because we worked four shifts, four on, four, four on, four off. And I'd come in and spend the four days with my children. I'd work at the mine for four. And then you were saying, unfortunately, you got injured, though. What was the injury? Pardon? You said you, unfortunately, got injured at the mine, right? You said you had an injury? Mm -hmm. What was the injury? I fell off my loader. And that was my own stupid mistake, really, because it was coffee break. And I won't leave unless the job's done. So I said, well, I want to finish the job and like it'll be 15 minutes, whatever, and then I'll go for my tea. I was scraping out the uh, steam bay. So then I had to stop for something and I was climbing out and I slept and I fell. And you know, mining equipment is way bigger than highway equipment. I fell. And my elbow fell into the grate of the floor and my body twisted on it. So I smashed my elbow into tiny little puzzle pieces. And uh, that's when I was on WCB. Right. And then you told me about all. Yeah, I told you about that. Wow. That is quite the story. Quite the, I guess, challenges that you've had to overcome throughout those years. I can't imagine that was easy, but, but you didn't give up, which is good. But I, then when I, I, I called WCB, I said, well, if I'm going off and I said, could I go back to school? And they said, no, not until we say. So I thought, no, I'm going to go right now. I didn't tell them that, but I went. So halfway through, they called me, now you can start. I said, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Little did they know you were ahead of the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you for telling us about your own family. Um, now, I guess maybe just to round that off, you said you got married again, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, First, I didn't tell you how many children I have. Oh, that's true. I have six children. I lost one. I have five sons and one daughter. I have four grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. And so this marriage, we met at the mine. Um, 
I was just so down on men, you wouldn't believe it. Like, don't come near me, don't even look my way. Uh, I was through, through, through. <laughs> and anyway, my husband would come in the steam bay and come visit me. And I thought, he's in here a lot too often, you know, and I, then I'd forget about it. And then one day, I was coming down the hall in, in the shop and I seen him and he had the door open for me a long ways away and my face is just covered with mud. And he's just smiling and bringing my knees turned to water and I thought, what the hell you old fool, you don't do that no more. <laughs> <laughs> and then he opens the door, hi, hi, and then I go up for my coffee. And when the ladies were in the ladies' dry, and I said, guess what? I just met my husband. <laughs> and they're just like, no way. You know, you hate men. I said, yeah, I did. Until now. <laughs> What's his name? I don't know. Where does he work? I don't know, but we were dressed the same. So it's here somewhere. <laughs> we had coveralls on, hard hats, safety glasses, work gloves. Very attractive, <laughs> full of mud. <laughs> I never worry how I look in the morning. <laughs> he could fall in love with that. Well, <laughs> good man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Um, so then, did you guys then, when you got married again, did you guys continue to live here? Uh, we lived in Tumblr. Well, I had bought in a house. In Tumblr? Uh, yeah, uh, no, in Puskubi. Okay. I said, that was my goal. I said I was not going to owe anybody any money because I was making my own. I didn't have to ask for money, right? Mm -hmm. My father helped me survive, paid it to pay it, but I paid him back every time. He'd say, no, 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 you're a threat. And I said, nope. I said, because I'll be back for it. But I've paid you, right? I don't owe you. Because if I keep it and I'll keep adding, 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 and I'll never be able to pay you back. I said, I don't like owing, and you taught me that. Yeah. So don't refuse me. <laughs> so he didn't. He'd take it. Because I'd be back anyway. And uh, so I bought this house. It's a cottage in Poos. And uh, this really proud of my own home. I said, nobody could ever kick me out again. <laughs> you know? Oh. That was my big goal. And then I said, when, you know, I'm going to just not owe anyone. And I, and it happened until I got these children and I had to go in a hole a little bit, but they come with nothing. But yeah, and then, okay, he proposed four times. Four times? <laughs> Why so many? Because I said no. <laughs> I said, he's so super nice, but once he signs, he's going to change. Sound familiar? Mm, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah. So, but my dad met him, and he liked him. He said, I know, I can tell he's a good man. So, that meant everything. So, and then I said, okay, I'll marry you, but I will not marry you in Dawson Creek. I said, you'll have to take me away. He said, okay, we'll get married on a cruise ship. I've always dreamt that I'd be married on a cruise ship. So I said, oh, I never dreamt that because I never want to do it again. But anyway, okay. <laughs> that works, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> So my girlfriend phoned me from Kamloops and she said, my friends just come back from Hawaii and they got married there and they have beautiful pictures. Sadie, I even got the name and number and everything for you. Do the cruise later. I said, okay. So she sent me the information. I phoned the guy and we booked for Hawaii and we were married in Oahu. Wow. And he said, I promise you, I will take you on a cruise on our fifth anniversary. And I said, okay. That's when I was injured. And um, in this corner building here was uh, uh, ladies' wear and jewelry. Yeah. And I became friends with the lady that owned it. It's Arlene. She's doing real estate now. 
But she always held that um, gala every year, black tie, you know? Actually, this one was for ladies, ladies' night, and uh, it was a Mexican Riv Riviera uh, cruise was the ma main prize. And uh, I could never come. She'd always invite me, and it was always on my work shift, and I wouldn't uh, miss work for nothing. So I was, sorry I can't come. It's my work. Let's take the time off. No, no, I don't do that. So anyway, this time now with my injury, I had all the time in the world. So I came to that gala and none of my sisters would come for, with me because they're going to a bingo in Grand Prairie. That's big time. So I said, well, they said, how much are the tickets? I said, $50. Oh, $50. We're going to bingo in Grand Prairie. Okay. So my oldest son's girlfriend said, I'm looking for somebody to go with. I'll, let's go together. I said, okay. So we come. And uh, they also had silent auction. And I seen this beautiful long gown. And I said, oh my God, I love that. So uh, we, you get free tickets first. And then you buy them after that. So I bought a whole bunch of them. And I just doubled them up and threw them in the pot for that dress. I never picked anything else. Well, I won the dress and it was over $200, the dress. So I said, I got, I just relaxed after that. I got my money back and then some, you know. I could tell my sisters, you know, you should have come. Well, then the big prizes they were drawing and uh, second prize was uh, sapphire earrings. Very nice. And she won. Your friend? My son's girlfriend. Oh, wow. She. I said, how could you be so lucky? Now the crews, everybody just like you could drop a pin. Huh? And uh, so I'm just kind of looking around. Sadie Lucan. And I said, did I hear my name? And everybody's just hollering, hollering. And, and, uh, and she says, you won. What? <laughs> My mom's hanging up and they take a picture in newspaper. <laughs> I won the cruise. Five wow. year anniversary. Wow. That's Don't have to think of it. He didn't buy that, did he? <laughs> <laughs> you took him. <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm glad you got to go on that. Um, now I'm going to bring us back to some of these because we went off into some very good stories, but, um, you were telling me a little about your community there. Um, as far as, well, you began to tell me how you volunteered for the Métis, um, society, which you eventually became the president of. Were you involved in anything else in your community? Any other... Uh, organizations or anything like that? Well, we had dance theater for the children. Yep. Um, we traveled. It was a traveling theater group. Yep. Um, and uh, I've always worked and taught the Cree language, you know, whenever I had spare time but I could never totally focus on it because I was always stuck in the office. And I mean stuck, you know, but, <laughs> um, but every free time I had, I would do stuff. We would do stuff within the Métis. We'd celebrate Louis Riel. We'd do the uh, flag raising in, uh, at the city hall. And we'd have lunches and like the stew and the bannock always. And uh, and I did the, uh, I don't know if you read that poster up. Yeah. So I did that with the Métis teens. Oh, that's very nice. And the uh, mayor at that time was Bern, uh, what the heck's his name again? I don't think I was there, otherwise I'd help you out on that one. I know. I don't think I was around. But he helped 
My husband did the instruction on the sash. We weaved that ourselves. Oh, that's really cool. The doll, the children that were involved, the community. We didn't have our own building at that time. We rented the uh, Friendship Center and we had our uh, wind up celebration there. And the mayor came and uh, we did our presentations and we pr presented him with a, um, and there I go again, losing my words. You know, the, the provincial flag in a frame? Wow. A shadow box. And it, sits, it hangs at City Hall. And we also presented him with another flag to hang every year. That time with the teenagers. Wow. So did you start making like Métis sashes after that? Or was that just something that no, you were it was just too hard. It's a lot of work. And uh, no, we just started buying them then. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We had homemade equipment and, and it took a long time. And my original plan was to one day use it as a border in my office. Mm. I don't think so. So we settled for a frame. <laughs> frame it was. We did that and then we'd uh, hold talent shows different age groups and we would present them with medals and uh, money prizes yeah so but a lot of it come from uh, oil and gas just recently now they're starting to provide us with money from MNBC but before that we were kind of on our own right but I didn't want it to die so I volunteered my time for 15 years. I worked there with no wage. You must have liked it. Mm -hmm. oh, I did, and I can't say uh, I regret it because I got to go to all the meetings, the conferences in Vancouver. I didn't have to pay for anything, and I met be wonderful, beautiful people. Otherwise, I wouldn't have. You know, I gave them my time. What? Now, speaking of meeting all those people, did you, who would you say uh, influenced you the most in your life growing up or maybe later on uh, as you were an adult? Did you have anyone in your family or outside of your family who maybe influenced you? My father and a brother. Okay. And why do you pick them specifically? Because they were so openly had my back. My father always encouraged me. He could always see in the future that I would do something wonderful for the people. My brother cried when I said, I'm going back to school. He said, you have the courage to do so. He said, I've always wanted to, I never, because we all had to quit early to work. Right. Now, and what about um, any, did you have any elders along the way that you met? that maybe had an impact? I met a lot of elders during my studies. Oh, did you? Because we did the Aboriginal studies, right? For a while, then we went on to the college in Edmonton. But for the first part of the studies, every week there was a different elder from a different community, different traditions, uh, culture slightly different. It was all a variety and a lot of good learning. I've got like, stuff written down that they've taught me. And I asked their permission if I could write it down and keep it because some prefer to be private, right? Mm -hmm. And I always ask for permission to do it. And I've kept it all and treasured it. Now I hope to leave it behind. What would be maybe some of the ones that uh, were okay with you sharing? What would be some of the best things they taught you? I think, um, The pipe ceremony. Okay, why do you pick that one? Because we don't do that in the Métis. And I just lost a brother and my, and my family didn't want me to travel because I was upset. And I said, that's where I need to be. I said, the elder will help me start to heal and he'll start me on my healing journey. That's where I need to be, I won't do it here. So I drove 
And uh, it was amazing because you sit in a circle and, and you smoke the pipe, right? And he motioned to me to sit beside him. And I thought, why me? Or was he looking at me, you know? And he walks over and takes me in the arm and said, I want you to sit here. I said, okay, thank you. So I sat beside him. And then he was passing out cloths and he was telling the meaning of the cloths. I've got that written down too, but I can't. And he gave me a yellow cloth. And uh, he said, okay. He said, I know you don't smoke. And I thought, how does he know that? So he said, hold it over your heart. That's good. He said, you don't have to draw on it. So hold it over your heart. And I said, okay. And it just like something went into my fingernails, the tips of my f fingers, and it just traveled right through my body. I've never felt that before. Actually, I did. I'll tell you that one too. And uh, I thought I, was, I experienced my first, first circle with the pipe. And uh, that was a lifelong experience because I just treasured that. It was different, right? Others, the other elders like were things I knew already. So that didn't have the same effect. I mean, I appreciated it, but mm -hmm. this was new. And, and he said, and after we were done, again, he signaled me over. He said, here is a tea to heal your heart. Now he didn't know I just, I was, well, I guess he did, must have showed, right, that I was in pain. He gave me, he said, a bear tea. He said, drink this, my girl. He said, you will start to heal in your heart. And I slept like I've never slept before. Yeah, so, and the other lesson I, I never forget is the one I got from my own father. He taught me a lot. Uh, one day he said, I need to get some medicines. You want to come with me? And I said, sure. So we got in the vehicle, we took off, we went to the bush and he was explaining the medicines he needed. And um, so he said, you know, my girl, he said, I want to teach you how to pray. And I thought, holy man, really? I've been in church just about every day of my life growing up. <laughs> but he said, I really want to teach you how to pray. And I said, oh, okay. I want you to teach me how to pray. So he said, okay. We'll find a nice tree and we'll sit down. Okay. So we come to this tree. It is beautiful all by itself. Like all, you know, away from the rest there all around. He said, we'll sit here. So you got a twig, like laid it down, and he uh, put three cigarettes down. And he said, this one's for you. That's for the creator, Manato. And this one's for me. But he said, I'll hold mine because I smoke. And then after that, I'll teach you how to pray. Okay. So he lit the cigarettes and put them down. And then he started talking to me. And as he was talking, he was just talking about life in general and our needs and things to be thankful for and the things around us that we just take for granted. Um, and he'd draw on his cigarette and the other two would draw too. Yes, I seen it with my own eyes. He'd draw, they'd draw. When he finished, they finished too. And he said, took the ashes, made a little hole, make sure they were cold, put them in there, covered it up. This is a very special experience. And he said, okay, we can go now. I thought he never taught me how to pray. He forgot. But you never question your elder, right? So halfway down. Well, what do you think? He said, you're going to pray like that? That was prayer. Oh, I love it. I said, that's how I pray. He said, yeah, 
My mom was a devout Catholic. We're going straight to hell. We don't learn our prayers. I was deathly afraid of the Catholic Church, but I ran to it. Every time there's a service, I ran all the way so the devil didn't catch me. With my father, I could die this moment and not worry one bit because I'm going to a better place. He taught me spirituality. Now, in, in all that, where does then God fall into that realm for you then? Pardon? Where does God fall into that, in, in those different styles then? For you? God is in both. God is in both. But the devil overpowers sometimes in the Catholic Church because of fear. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to die. So how do you see God then? I see God the same way. But I, call, I follow the Catholic faith to honor my mother, and I do spirituality to honor my father. But it's sad to say I have left the Catholic Church just recently, but I still have my faith, I still have my God, which should be one God for the whole universe, not divided like everything else. That's where we lost our power, dividing, we lost our unity, we lost our strength. We live in straight lines, we lost our circle, we lost our strength. I was also taught by my father. And I've read in books after that. And my father was illiterate. He taught me about the medicine wheel. And I paid big money to go and study this medicine wheel. And I knew it all. Well, not all. There was slight differences, but basic part of it I knew already. You always told me about that special tree, you know, the sacred tree. Yeah. That's really cool. And after, you know, having such wonderful experiences with all these people in your life, but also after, I guess, knowing what it's like to struggle in many other areas of your life, mm -hmm. what would you want to then pass on to, you know, anyone that will watch this video many years from now or anyone that may watch it, you know, anytime soon. What message would you like to pass on? I would say live your life today. Don't plan and put off things because life is short. Make yourself happy. Encourage your children to do so. It's rough losing one. Well, Sadie, thank you for sharing all that. We really appreciate it. And I know when people watch this, they're really going to enjoy it because you shared some wonderful wisdom. Some I don't even know what I said, so I don't know. <laughs> Good thing it's all here. But really, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me or having me. Nice meeting you. You're a very gentle man. And thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi.